Amen. Just off the rip, one of the first things I want to share is I feel like Jesus is coming after this warfare of trying to fight to believe his love for us. Where it's like, okay, God, I know you think you feel this way about me, but I don't really feel loved. And I have to do this like spiritual warfare just to remind myself that I'm loved. And I feel like God's just cutting this off. We are going to stand in love and know that that we're loved. And that's it. And it reminds me of the scripture. And let me pull this up because my iPad's going to help me get this through. It says in Isaiah 50, for the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been ashamed or humiliated. Therefore, I have made my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Verse 7 in this goes on to say this, which is, the, which is what I want to really just emphasize and highlight. <clears throat> Actually, it's the first verse, just kidding. Where is the certificate of divorce? By which I have sent your mother away, O Israel. But I believe the Lord would ask us the same thing. Where is the certificate of divorce where you think I got fed up with you and make you work your way into good standing with me and fight hard just to believe what is true about you and that's never changing? All this mental gymnastics just so that we can enjoy God is done. Jesus wants you to be confident in the love of God. Fully confident, fully known, fully loved. No matter how jacked up you are, no matter how many times you fall, your value is not based on how strong you are. When I, uh, when I met the Lord, I'm going to let you know I was a basket case. I don't know if I have anybody in here who used to be a basket case, but I was a mess. I grew up going to church, was, you know, a very, like, very, very traditional Southern Baptist. I mean, especially on holidays, you made sure you were there. And when you got done, you went to Golden Corral or um, what are the other ones? Ryan's. I mean, y'all. That's, that's where the ark went after church. You followed the ark to Ryan's after that three-point sermon. You got out and you followed the ark to Golden Corral, too. And... I could honestly say in, 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 in the mechanics of what I was taught and learned, I never encountered Jesus because I was like, oh, this is how you have to do it. And it, it, it didn't come from, I would say, even, you know, like a real place in me. It was just taught like, this is what you do. This is how you're going to, you know, go to church. This is what going to church looks like. You go to church, you sing some songs, you hear a message. You try not to fall asleep because your parents will slap you in the leg. You you go, you know, and then you're done. And you try not to cuss throughout the week or do anything sinful. And then you you get to heaven one day. but Or unless the rapture happens. And you better make sure that God wasn't mad with you before that. Because left behind came out and made you feel like you were doomed. And so you said the sinner's prayer every single day. And you're like, Lord, I don't, can I be extra saved? Can I make sure I get like a, like a fire insurance card and... <clears throat> You know, I never, I never knew the love of God for me. I never knew the links he would go for me to win me back. And so when I was a little kid, around the time of eight or nine, I was exposed to sexual activity. And somebody had experimented what they saw in porn on me. And that carried on for a period of time by someone of the same sex. And so naturally, um, when that happened, my first response, it kind of got quiet. Everyone was like... Dang, that's deep. Well, when this thing happened, okay, when you're in the moment, it definitely does not feel like it was a bad thing that happened. Initially, like, you're like, okay, why is this person touching me? But after the fact, your body responds the way it's supposed to. So I didn't know what I was coming into agreement with. And then when I saw porn again and saw gay porn, I was like, oh, this is normal. Like, this is, I guess this isn't weird until I heard people around me saying like, oh, you're a sissy, you're a queer, you're this or that. Especially, y'all, I live in the Bible Belt of Truth, Columbus, Georgia. So this is like you go to school and everyone around you is wearing gym shorts and boots and like a hunting jacket. And 
you have me wearing skinny jeans and dressing the way I do. And I was like, I'm doomed. And everyone kept bullying me saying, oh, you're just, you know, I'm just going to say it. People were saying, oh, you're just a faggot. You're just this. You're just that. You're, this is who you are. And I'm like, what does that even mean? I didn't even know what it was. I was reproducing what had done, was done to me and living it and acting out and seeing it and watching it and, and partaking. And I didn't even know what it was because I didn't talk to my parents because they had their own levels of trauma that they didn't even know how to come out through. So intimacy for them was like, I bought you food. We went to the drive through and you got like a happy meal, like figure it out. You know what I mean? And so, or the best phrase was suck it up and drive on. Like that was like another, that was another one where you just kind of don't really process what you're going through. You just kind of suck it up and drive on. And it was, I think that's also kind of like a generational thing where our parents didn't learn how to process. And so the filter that they try to give us love from, while it might be fractured, they were never taught how to process. So we're expecting them, which, I mean, kind of shift perspectives, we're expecting them to give something to us that they never taught. We're never taught. So we've got to step out of, like, a bitter perspective and be like, man, my parents sucked. They were so mean. It's like, dude, they really didn't know. Period. But going back into this, when I found out what being gay was, I felt like I was doomed and I definitely didn't hear about it from like a hopeful perspective in the church, you know, especially with like Westboro Baptist, not that that's a real thing, but, um, or like maybe even a remnant, like, I mean, obviously God paid for everybody, but hearing like, Oh, if you don't turn, you're going to burn. And, you know, let's just, you know, if you were to die tonight, I'm like, man, why does everybody die tonight? Like what is going on in this church? Like, are we, I mean, what is happening? Like, people just dropping left and right, and you better say that prayer. Like, make sure you're safe. But, you know, I never had the assurance. Like, I was like, man, I believe that being gay was my death sentence. And so I thought, well, might as well live my life before the rapture happens because I'm not going to be able to make it, and so I might as well have fun in the world while I can. Um, So I just dove into it. I stopped going to church. I started doing drugs. I started partying because of the way that sexuality and expression and acting out happened. It was very, very shame-based. So the the first time I have this happen where I actually go with somebody, he exposes me in front of the school, tells everybody what happened, um, which made me fight for control like a control freak. Um, and I was like, no one's ever going to hurt me. Has anybody ever made a vow in here? I'm never going to be hurt by that again. <clears throat> Girl, that thing's a magnet. I'm never going to go through that again. It's like, swoo, swoo, like in the spirit, everybody coming around you that wants to do the same thing that you just walked through. So, um, I went to this place of, I, I, I had no way to, I didn't know how to act out. And so I let porn be my teacher. And so you know, there's not this thing that says, like, this isn't real life. These are actors. It's kind of like you just do whatever. And that porn profits off your trauma. Like, if you see stuff like people always say, like, my friend's dad, the door. It's like people are playing off of father wounds. And money is being made at the cost of, like, exploitation and a fragmented soul. So for me, I was like, oh, this is how you connect with people. This is how you connect with the love of a father. You just find a daddy, and then you hook up with him. Like, that's pretty simple, right? Or an older man. Or like, that's what you do. And when I was partaking of that and going into that, it was like my soul was, like, getting super jacked up. And so there comes the drugs, like, wanting to get high and party all the time because I couldn't handle what I was doing. And then when people found out about me, I had to live, like, a dual life. I was like, that wasn't me. That was you know, this person and like almost living like I had two different people inside me and believing, you know, God, it would be so much easier if I wasn't born because I did not ask for this. And I don't believe anybody really asked for same sex attraction. Like I wasn't like, I just came out one day and I was just like, today's a good day to be gay. Like this is the life that I want. I experienced something, I kept going and you know, that's the way iniquity is. There's a bent and so it, it became a thing in me. And um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to, to, to flow with this. But in this regard, whenever all this stuff was happening, I got to a place where I was very depressed, suicidal, 
And I had no way to cope because of the things that I was doing. I felt it'd be easier if I wasn't born. I didn't ask to be gay. Um, it'd be easier if I was a girl because, um, you know, I can't have kids and I like men and I can't get married because, I mean, you know, let's see, 10, 12 years ago, it wasn't like super accepted as much as it is now. I mean, you, you got bullied if you were gay. I mean, people didn't like you. And nowadays it's like you're canceled for the rest of your life if you said something in 2001. And, you know, you better go back and be an ally immediately, like immediately conform. And I'm like, man, like this was not here when I was going through the life. Not that I'm, I regret that, but it's just it was a struggle to even admit this is who I was and where I was at, and I didn't want it at the same time. And so even if I had what I wanted and acted out with somebody, it still came at a cost. I could hook up, and as soon as the person left, I wanted to die. Like, and I mean, in the moment, I'm not thinking that. In the moment, I'm like, yes, this is great. And then when the person leaves, I'm like, I'm alone. Yeah. And I didn't have a way, I didn't know how to come out of that and, like, have a kingdom lifestyle. And so for people who come out of what I've come out of, the goal isn't just telling somebody to stop. Or, what it, like, if you don't know how to lead to my new identity, just say that. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, we have to give somebody something that we have. And these people believe that this is the core of who they are because they fought to get through that, that struggle to come out of that. So saying stop it is, like, shutting a door on them and being like, you just got to find the light of Christ on your own. Yeah. Right? So I had thoughts and I was, you know, really wrestling because, <clears throat> like I said, I didn't want this. I didn't choose this. It was, it was a, a real painful place in me. And um, around the, I got saved in 2012. So prior to that, I really dove headlong into the occult. I wanted something that looked like you know, I was like, let me just watch a bunch of Charles Manson videos. Like, I was, like, in a deranged place. Have y'all ever been into, like, one of those, like, YouTube black holes where, like, I started off on this video, and then, like, now I'm, like, in this conspiracy theory. Like, follow me here. I'm trying to, like, lighten the mood. You can go somewhere on YouTube, and then you end in the depths. Well, I found this rabbit trail, and I was in the depths trying to find my identity and, like, the craziest things going on. I'm like, yeah, I just hate people, and I love all these murder stories and whatever. But really, it was the, the demonic kind of, like, growing and building on my life. And um, I had a lot of experiences right before I got saved, and I didn't know people were praying for me. So after I dropped out of school, it was just a lot of binging and acting out and hooking up and doing crazy stuff. And then the occult broke out. And then I'm going to shift into where Jesus came in because this is where it gets super gravy and awesome. But when this stuff was going on, I started having really spiritual experiences that I had no way to like explain. Like I was, I had this one video. I wish I, my friend didn't delete it because it'd be super cool to like show people. They probably think it'd be like edited, but I was in a car with one of my friends and um, we were like being dumb. And I forgot even how this happened, but we were making jokes. It was like three or four in the morning. And something like, I was sitting in front of my house, just in our car, like not smoking, just sitting, I don't know. And something goes, boom, on the car and hits it. And I was like, what, what was that? And we freaked out. My friends started driving, and we were recording videos of us laughing. I know some of y'all are like, I would never record my videos of myself, but then TikTok says otherwise with all these adults out here doing these dances. And um, anyways, that was dry. So <laughs> basically... When we left, I looked at the video, and y'all, there was this deep red, dark, like, burgundy velvet cloud trying to come over me, and, like, all these, like, orbs flying the video. Now, I'm not being like, did you see that orb? That was something. Did you see that? I'm not like that. But it was very noticeable from an iPhone camera that something wonky was happening prior to that thing happening. Like, something was manifesting in the natural that was demonic. And it was only on me, not my friend. And I started having things where, like, something told me, you're going to die tonight. You're going to die tonight. And I'll be like, God. And I knew from my background, I'm like, God, please forgive me. Please, into my heart. I'm sorry. I'm never going to be getting into it. And then when I woke up, I'm like, shoo, I made it. And it was back to like life as I knew in the world. I'm like, ha ha, you ain't getting me. So we're about to do today. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then before I went to bed, Jesus, you know, I was, <laughs> Father, I come to you in my time of need. You said, <laughs> I promise you it was not like that. But. I would say a prayer to get out of trouble because I wasn't ready to surrender. I just didn't want my consequences of my actions. And 
around October, this guy reached out to me because I was very depressed. I wrote songs about wanting to kill myself. I was in a metal band. Um, I'm excited to like work on singing and growing that. That's something that I'm passionate about. Music has always been a close thing to my heart. But before, I used to do like heavy, crazy like metal music. I'll show you something. If I can pull it up really quick just to show you the difference. So um, basically, I went from – I'll show you. This is funny, and it's kind of different, but um, let me see. Are you guys okay? Is this Okay. I'm just inviting you into my life. In Jesus' name, this isn't going to defile you or do anything weird. You're okay. So this is me. I used to, like, just write songs like, I hate you. I want to die. I hate you. I hate you. Like, and people were like, yeah, that's so good. And, like, Nobody really knew how to, like, check me and be like, are you okay? Like, what you're saying is a lot of anger. Like, are you okay? And I was like, I used to have, like, really crazy stretched out ears, like, almost two inches stretched out and, like, had dermals and all stuff. I mean, I have nose rings now because I like them, but back then it was like, you better not mess with me. Like, even though I looked like David Blaine and I was very skinny, like an anemic David Blaine, it was like, don't mess with me. Don't touch me. Hey, baby boy. So... Basically, um, I got to this point where I wanted to change, and I was in that environment. I was writing songs about how I wanted to die and how I just didn't want to live anymore, and I felt like nobody was checking on me, and nobody was, you know, it was like my way of getting attention. Like, I really wanted attention, and I wanted connection. I wanted affirmation. I wanted to feel like somebody loved me and wanted to fight for me. I wanted to be pursued. All the girls in here are like, oh, pursuit. <laughs> Chase me, Jesus. Yes, God, in a field of lilies. <laughs> Just make me feel wanted. Watch TV with me and hold my hand and then get off and then eat with me and then go away. But why are you going away? Come back. I love you, babe. I'm not talking about you at all. One bit. <laughs> but I wanted to be pursued. And as funny as that sounds, men do want to be pursued. Like, that's not a weird thing. Um, I wanted, I wanted a father. I wanted somebody to make me say, I wanted somebody to say, "You belong, and I'm never going to leave you, and you're worthy of love." Like that was the core ache of my heart that I wanted to get through sex, and I couldn't. And so, I felt led one day to change my life. And um, this guy, of course, I'm, I mean, I'm a millennial, so I put it on Facebook. I was like, I feel motivated, and and. If someone comments, like, well, you should have got your life together for you, I'm like, mind your business. Mm. I was like a keyboard <laughs> warrior, okay? Has anybody had those? You get those spunky family members on Facebook, and you're like, okay, if you didn't want my opinion, hello? I was like, I don't care, yeah! I was manifesting. Um, well, I was. So fast forward, this guy reached out to me and was like, hey, I believe the Spirit of Christ put this in you. And I was like, hey, we should hang out. Man, I'm going to tell y'all, I was jacked up, so I was like, ooh, this could probably turn into something. <laughs> My God, I still got it, right? And I was like, we're going to hang out, and this could turn into something. This dude came on assignment, and he was a kingdom man ready to bring the gospel to, to this hot mess S with a lot of S's, and... I'm sitting here, and this guy's hanging out, and I was like, oh, my gosh, but what if he, like, rapes me or something? Like, what if this, like, oh, my God. And the thing that I used to, like, the thing that I used to desire and go into this broken place from porn because of one time I almost got kidnapped, and then I, like, fantasized about being raped. So it's so funny. The thing that I, like, had that broke me into this, like, really deep, dark place, now the enemy wanted me to use it to be scared of meeting with somebody who was carrying the anointing and the key for me to come out, like, I'm like, what if he does? Oh, I've seen too many Lifetime movies. Like, I don't want to do this. Don't answer the phone. Don't message back. You're going to be okay. Just don't. And I'm like, well, what if I do hang out? Like, what if I do go? So I was torn, and you know I'm crazy. So I was like, all right, whatever. This dude lived like three streets over from me just to, level, just to let you know how like intense this was. It wasn't like I could just run away because then he'll know where I live. Like, pff. So I'm like going through all my survival scenarios in my head. And I was like, whatever. So we hung out. Bro, this dude carried the love of Jesus. It was so, like, unreal. I'll tell you how. 
So we were hanging out, walking. He was asking me what I believe about Jesus. And I was like, yeah, you know, I just don't believe I have free will because I don't want to go to hell. And yeah. I was like in this really victim place, okay? Just bear with me. But this dude was like, no, nah, man, the gospel is this. Like, da, da, da. And I was like, okay, well, I'm still wrestling and I don't know what I believe. Ugh. And this thing keeps like flapping on my back. I'm like, what is touching me? So... Y'all, I've seen too many videos on TikTok with these random roaches, and it scarred me. I might need some deliverance. Where I'm like, what? Is this a bug? Don't set me off. I'll be, I'm, I'll pull out that sword. Huh? That's what it is right there. That's a roach killer. So this guy was wanting to hang out, and we went and we we're walking and you know, I don't know if y'all ever know this, but your parents are like, don't talk to strangers and don't do this and ignore them. And if someone's homeless, like you don't want to talk to them because they're on drugs. And that's like anti-kingdom just off the rip. I mean, obviously you want to teach your kid about awareness, but like you don't teach your kids to hate people you don't know. And so this guy that I'm hanging out with, this homeless guy comes up and he's like, hey man, I need to go get a drug test and I gotta go to social care. Can you take me, bro? And I'm like, I see through your plan. You ain't killing me. You ain't killing me. <laughs> like, you ain't getting me. Like, you know, in my mind, I was like, ah, we ain't going nowhere with you, sir. And my friend was like, yeah, dude, get in the car. I'm like, both of y'all on drugs. I ain't going nowhere. I've watched too many movies to get stabbed, left in the ditch. It ain't happening. I don't care. You a Christian, you're going straight to God. I don't know where I'm going. Like, I am going to be safe here outside of Barnes and Nobles, and I don't have a car, so I'm going to borrow a phone here and ask my parents to come pick me up. Have a good day. That's where I was internally. So I got in the car with this dude because <laughs> I didn't have a ride home, and literally this dude's sharing Jesus with him. He's like, man, Jesus loves you so much. I mean, making eye contact. You know, if you don't meet somebody, if you meet somebody you don't know, eye contact is Man, it takes every every bit of energy you got in you sometimes if you're on, like, a bad day. Let's just be real. Sometimes you don't want to talk to nobody, and that's okay. But in this moment, I was like, man, this dude's, like, connecting here. Like, they they went to school together. Like, it's a reunion. Like, and I was like, man, we, I'm about to die. I'm on drugs. Do I stay and do these drugs with them? What do I do? Here we go. And I'm, like, going through these scenarios. At the end, thank God I didn't die. This dude goes and says, hey, man, I just want you to know Jesus loves you, man. He's so real, and he loves you. And the guy's like, thank you, man. Like, I feel that. And I was like, what is happening here? Like, um, dude. Like, I don't know how to do, like, a survival song. I just ruined that joke. Sorry. God forgive me for that dry joke. Amen. So <clears throat> we went to my house after we dropped this guy off to get his um, drug test. And we're sitting in my driveway, and this is where the meat and gravy happens. So it's not just a comedy act. I promise you there's some fiery anointing on this bit. So we get to my driveway, and he's like, man, I'm telling you, God's reaching out for you. He wants you. And I'm like, look, if I hear someone say you need to get right with God, you know, God doesn't give you anything you can't handle. Um, just you got to trust God. You just got to give it to God. I'm not even born again. I don't even know how to give nothing. I'm keeping everything because I don't want to lose nothing. Like, in my mind, I'm like, how do I give something to somebody I can't even see? What does that look like? Just, <laughs> is it going to move? Is it going to get off me? Okay, what do I do? And I remember he was like, bro, I'm telling you. And so in a very unemotional prayer, which I know so after we get saved, we'd be like, hey, Jesus, hi. But in this moment, I was like, God, if you still want me, please save me. And the fire of God fell on me in my driveway, dude. It was like, and I was like, whoa. And I started shaking my head. It was the very first time I ever manifested the Holy Ghost. And I was like, what was that? And my friend was like a super hippie, like Bethel era, like 2011, 2012. So it was like, yeah, it's the Holy Spirit. And I was like. Man, this day just keeps getting weirder, dude. This was real, but you, you might have something going on, baby. And <clears throat> it was, it was, it was so different. Like I was like, I answered, I, I prayed and God did something. Like, what was that? A week later, I go to a Bible study with my pastor who will be here 
tomorrow. I've been in covenant with this man for 10 years. My God. Um, and he was like, hey, man, I want to go to Starbucks with you, and I want to hang out with you. I don't know what you're thinking about this message I'm teaching. And at this time, I looked like Prince as like a Hot Topic model mannequin, like goth, but like a jerry curl. And I had like dark eyebrow makeup, and I was like, why do you want to know what I think? And I was like... <laughs> That was perfection, dude. That's your breakthrough right there. The joy of the Lord, dude. So literally, I was like, I can't even do that again. That was so perfect. Thank you, God, for this live stream. So literally, I was like, why do you want to know what I think? I'm dressed like this. And the guy was, my pastor said this in front of everybody. He's like, I love the way you dress. I think you look handsome. And I was so shut down by like a straight man affirming me, but not wanting some like sneaky thing. And I was like, oh my God, what is that? I was like, what is love? I've never felt that, like, being dramatic. But in the moment, he was like, hey, man, I'm going to go hang out with you. And I was like, okay. I was so desperate for love, dude. I was like, I'll hang out with a dog. Like, yeah. whatever. Like, I'm there. <clears throat> so fast forward, and we go to Starbucks, and this is the first time I ever got prophesied over. Praise God. Yeah. But <clears throat> you could have told me at this time the Bible teaches you how to levitate. And I've read, like, and this time in my life, I had read 15 pages of my Bible. So I grew up in church, but I didn't really get in the Bible. It was just kind of like, you know, you got to have a vision. You got to have a focus. And you got to have a way to execute it. And Christ is every one of those steps. And we'll see you next time. I mean, like, that was kind of like the normal. So if someone's like, hey, dude, I feel like God has, like, a prophetic word for you. I'm like, okay. Like, I didn't have a grid of, like, you know what I mean? It was just very, like, I don't know. And I don't know, like the influencers of our time, like church message. So we hung out and he was, I was like, sure, man, like you can share this prophetic word with me. And literally he was like, the Holy Spirit told me that um, you were molested when you were younger and that you struggle with homosexuality and God wants you to know that he's with you and Jesus is going to walk with you through this thing, man. And I was like, Charles Xavier, get out of my mind. Like I met a real life X-Man, like. This is some stuff. So, <clears throat> y'all, this is what Jesus got. This was the joy set before him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He made me just like him. I'm telling you, Jesus is just this silly. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because my encounters with him afterwards, like, super marked me. Okay? So I get saved. A week or two later, I get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Whoa. Yay! And it, huh? And I can say I know for myself, Ebo Shada. But I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and it was like this encounter. I'm like, yeah, I'm riding this spiritual wave. And then it was like, boof, everything that I ever like suppressed and like hid from God and tried to deny just started coming up. And I was like, I can't handle this. I got to drink. I got to act out. I got to watch this video. I got to do this. And I was like going everywhere but God. And I started getting offended with my leaders. I was like, you know what, you, I started seeing their weakness. I'm like, you are just like this. And I mean, like, has anybody ever seen that movie, The Miracle Maker on uh, YouTube? It's like a claymation Jesus movie. Yes. Okay, you remember how Mary was like, I know you are Jesus. Yeah. I mean, that was where I was. I was like, my leaders are corrupt. And, eh. But I was like freaking out, okay? Like, real talk. And my pastor just kept praying for me. I mean, like, when I got saved, this dude let me live on his couch. They, they were married for five months. I don't know any honeymoon couple want to give up their couch to Prince looking like Marilyn Manson while you're in that Song of Solomon stage, okay? And so this man was like, come on, baby. We got, he bought my food three times a day. I mean, this man died to himself to get me into the fold. He said, you are about to experience Jesus. And I was like, what even is that? Like, so he, he kept like, he kept pursuing me and I was like, no. And I was just freaking out. Three demons getting cast out later. Praise God. Um, I had three specific encounters and I want to go to that to share the heart of God. And I know we've kind of shared a little bit, but I'm going to dive into the message aspect now. Praise God. 
that was all setting you up. That was an appetizer. That was a drink. That was a refill. That was some biscuits from, I mean, some uh, rolls from Texas Roadhouse with that cinnamon butter. Now we're about to dive into the steak, baby. <laughs> so I had this encounter where this girl I dated as a cover-up, like, it was not a very fluid, automatic thing for me. Um, saying that without trying to be TMI. Um, and I didn't know she got pregnant. And so a month after my encounters where I got a deliverance, she reached out to me and said, I had an abortion. Y'all, I've only been saved a month. Why I got to get that news? I mean, I just got my prayer language. I just got my shanda da ba. And then all of a sudden, this comes in. And I'm like, man, can, we, can I keep my tongues for two minutes like before something tries to knock the wind out of me again? And it's when you choose obedience and, and the road that you realize the opposition comes in for agreement so that you don't become a revealed son of God, regardless of how weak or strong you look to the people around you. You're, you're carrying glory, okay? So here I am struggling, and I just acted out. I got depressed, and so I went back into the mode of acting out, watching porn, doing the same stuff, and my pastor was like praying for me and just being really patient. Sometimes you got to deal with people and patiently endure evil for a hot minute. Praise God. And um, I had an encounter with Jesus when I wasn't looking for it. So my pastor was teaching on soaking prayer and how to connect with God and just be still. And when you sense him, just, <sighs> I'm like, what even is peace? Like, have you ever had one of those days? Like, what even is peace? This is a concept I do not have a grasp of. <laughs> and, I'm sitting here on this stage, and we're soaking, and um, I'm sitting here. I'm like, man, I can't connect. And my pastor is literally like, I'm just going to do this for dramatic purposes only. So my pastor is literally over here in, like, the, like the, the nether realm part of the room, and he's like, if you feel like you can't connect with God, why don't you ask him who you need to forgive? And I'm like, excuse me. Get about my conscience, man of God. Like, don't do this. And so I was like, God, who do I need to forgive? Immediately, clear as day, as I'm looking at you, in my eyes, in the spirit, I, when my eyes closed, I saw seven bullies come up in my mind, the people who call me faggot, queer, tell me I should kill myself, don't be friends with this person, he's gay. All of them start coming to my mind, and one by one, I forgave them. And it wasn't like this like, hard thing. I was like, God, I choose to forgive them. I release them. Like, I just hand you my frustration. And immediately, I got caught up in the spirit. Did not know even how to handle this. So when I tell you guys Jesus is silly, brace yourself. Because y'all think I might be a lot. But then when I met <laughs> Jesus, when I met Jesus, he reciprocated it back to me because he made us with his facets of his personality. And so he finds great delight in that. And so when you have encounters, you're not going to speak King James English like, Thine holiness, Lord, don't take us your spirit away. It's like... You're going to talk like yeah. you talk, and that's it. And don't question your encounters. That's your nugget right here. But while I was in this encounter, I go up to Jesus, and there's like this, like, this is going to be the display for this story. There's like this perfectly woven, like, almost like tithe basket. <laughs> it's like a manger, but that's like the best way to describe it. You ever seen those, like, woven baskets that people always put their tithe in? It looked like that. And I was like, here we go. See, God be having them supplies set up for me. He have know what I need. So it was like this basket that was just like this. Y'all, I'm sorry I'm all over the place and giving you the theatrics. It's just, it just comes with a package. So it looked like this. <clears throat> and I remember being like, what is that? And there was a baby in it. Had my cheeks, had my eye color, had curly hair, and I knew it by the spirit. It was a girl. And so I was like, I go up to Jesus, and I'm telling you, at this time, I hated kids, okay? Now I have about 700 of them. I have twins that we were like, oh, we can have another, because we had Jeremiah. So I have three under two. Pray me, pray my strength in the Lord. I'm asking you right now, pray right now, right now. <laughs> pray it in, but <laughs> that one didn't go over too well. It's okay. <laughs> I go up to this basket, and I'm like, it's like, say, Valerie's Jesus. This thing is, like, right next to the Lord. And I was like, Jesus, why is the first time I meet you, there's a baby here? Like, explain. This is the first time I ever had an encounter, the first time I saw him, and this is where my mind goes. Not like, dude, he's real, but, like, why a baby got to be here in my first 
five minutes with you. And Jesus smiled. I was like, you know who this is? And I was like, no, I don't. He was like, yeah, you do. Giving it right back to me. I was like, no, I don't. He was like, yeah, you do. I was like, no, I don't. He was like, yeah, you do. I was like, I, oh. <clears throat> the scene shifts, okay? And I'm in this place where I'm about to get married. I'm about to get married, and Father God's doing my bow tie. So I'm in this all-white expanse with Jesus, and there's a baby there. The scene shifts. I'm getting married, okay? This is literally the first vision I had outside of, like, seeing angels when I first got saved and went on a trip with my pastor. So um, he's doing my bow tie, and he's like, son, I don't want you to do this. Now, mind you, when I said, and I laid this story up with a very long foundation, was that I started backsliding after I got baptized in the Holy Ghost because I could not handle my pain. And meanwhile, in all this sin, I'm having this vision, okay? So I, I wasn't in the most, like, like mystic, like I've separated everything. I don't even like food. My body is just yours, God place. I was very much like the opposite, like, let's get drunk. Like, you know, like that's where my mind was. But God met me there. And don't ever question just because someone being in sin, meaning that Jesus can't just drop in on them. Like, we got to stop being super churchy in that regard. <clears throat> because I was not I was not in a good place, but my pastor prayed for me, and the effective, the righteous people pray is affected much. That's the right way to say it. Amen. That's it. Hey, Boshada. <laughs> so literally, in this vision, I'm like, no one ever lets me do what I want because the father just said, I don't want you to do this. So I ran out, and he was like, okay. And he lifted his hands. And I'm going to get married, and there's two aisles. And I'm coming from the back of the room. So the people over here are like weeping and crying. It's people I knew from church and people that I had friendships with. And they were just like distraught. And on the other side of the room, there was people I parted with, smoked with, did everything ungodly with. And they was just angry. Like they didn't even care about being there. And I was like, what? Does anybody, is anybody going to be happy about me getting what I want for a minute? You know what I mean? So I'm walking down. And I get to where my bride is. She has a mannequin face. Like I can't even make it out. I don't even know who it is. And the priest gets like the place where he's like, does anybody object? And immediately Jesus busts in the room and was like, I object. And so I remember, can you stand right here, Valerie, for another? <laughs> is this okay, y'all? Am I being too much? We, we're having fun? So hold your hand out. So I ran, and when I saw Jesus, he was in front of me. He touched me, and immediately I like had his perspective. And so the people right here started jumping up and down and rejoicing and the people right here started mobbing towards me and I was like what is going on and before I can even finish that Jesus was in front of me and he went like this and everybody froze and I was like what is happening and I went to turn to look at what else was going on in the room and when I turned Jesus was sitting there in front of me holding the baby that was in the basket in the very first part of the scene and he said son you are about to enter into covenant with your old life and if you did you wouldn't see your daughter in heaven now, I had prayed. I was like, God, is this even real? Is this girl trying to manipulate me? She said she had an abortion for attention because she has a crazy ex or a crazy person now. Like, it's 2012. Anything is possible. <laughs> and literally, in a, God answered something that I super really didn't have the language to pray. Out of like, I can't handle the weight if, if there's an abortion because of me. And he met me there. And so the scene shifts. We're all back in that white room. And Jesus is sitting on this rocking chair with my daughter, and we're watching myself, like, at the same angle through this, like, portal. It looked like Stargate SG-1, but take out, like, a weird, like, cartoon portal image and think of it like a window. Like, I was watching myself in the natural soaking on the stage next to Jesus and my daughter. And he was bouncing her on his, on his knee, and <clears throat> it was like those old school, like, uh, Bethel sets with Stephanie Gretzinger that was like, I don't want to talk about any other lover. You're the only one and there will be no other for me now. It was like this really like lively set. And Jesus was bouncing on his knee and she was holding her hands like this, watching me. And he looked at me and goes, she loves when you worship. And the scene ends. Oh, wow. And so I was like, what? Like, I ran outside, and I was crying, and my pastor was like, are you okay? I was like, I just saw my kid in heaven, and I saw, and I saw, the, and I saw, and then we was here, and then the like, people froze, and they ran at me, and then up and down, and up here, and he was just like, 
awesome, dude. Yeah, dude. Come on. I was like, I don't even know what to do with that. I, was, I mean, I was a mess. I had a scene where I saw myself in hell, and I told an apostle about this in the car, and um, where the Lord just like really went in and broke off prophetically a lot of this occult stuff. And then one of the other major um, visions I had was Jesus stepping into the room the night I was molested. <clears throat> and so um, I don't want to go into all the story just to save time, but am I good on time? Okay, well, I'm about to dive in. So I had got triggered because I had talked to this person and I had suppressed this memory. Huh? But the memory kept getting touched every time I talked. Like, I would meet this person, and there would always just be this unrealistic agitation that came from nowhere. As soon as I said goodbye on the phone, it was like, oh, I just want to fight. And I was like, where did this come from? I didn't even know that I was manifesting, something that happened to me. <clears throat> anyway, this guy I was with that was super prophetic. Y'all know y'all can't hide nothing from a prophet. You'd be mad and be like, I felt you pick up that anger five minutes ago. What you about to do with it? I'd be like, can you let my soul be and stop being a metal detector, finding everything I got in my pockets? Like, I'd be like, man, I'm about to. And the prophet's like, no, you're not. I'm like, I just thought it. Get out. Man, I'm hungry today. Don't eat that. I'd be like, that's the kind of culture our church is. I'm like, man, I ain't talked to nobody. My phone, I'm like. I'd be like, you know what? I'm about to isolate. I'm just going to play video games. And my pastor called me and be like, why are you isolating? <laughs> I didn't even say nothing to him. I'm like, man, you can't sin for nothing in this church. Not that you want to. It's just like a, even if you want a bad day, you can't even kick it. Because he's be like, I felt you kicking the spirit. <laughs> I grabbed your leg so that you might not stumble. <laughs> See, that was a good one. Yeah, now I got the anointing on those jokes now. Yo, I can't do, like, super, like, structured, like, stuff. I'm just silly. Hopefully this laughter is good for you, too. If you've got a hard season, just laugh. <laughs> so, basically, <clears throat> where am I going with this? So, in this vision, I had this, um, I asked Jesus to show me where he was, but it was set up because I had talked to this person who had the encounter. This is a person who abused me when I was younger. And I talked to this person on the phone, completely forgot about it. And um, my pastor was practicing, like, inner, one of my pastor friends was practicing inner healing tools. And so she was like, let's just see what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And my, friend, my friend's like, I have to forgive my dad for walking out on me. I see him leaving me at the pool. And I was like, oh, dude, it's coming for me. Like, and I didn't know what to expect. And my friend is just seeing Jesus, like, when his dad walked out, Jesus holding him and and praying for his dad and, like, trying to keep his dad from leaving and trying to convict him. And his dad, like, you know, like, you can see, like, his heart hardening and, like, his dad in pain. I mean, like, he was carrying, like, when Jesus shows you real painful stuff, at the very same time, he's imparting grace so that you don't hate the person because you can see them the way that he sees them. So you can see your dad leave and be filled with compassion, not anger. Right? Um, so... I close my eyes and I know I'm in the I'm in the room right before I got touched. I could feel the bed on my back. Like I knew where I was. And I was like, man, we're about to go somewhere real. Like, y'all ever have that when ministry time comes and you know Jesus is about to deal with that thing you don't want to talk about, and you're like, man. You get that anxiety, like, Lord, I don't want to talk about this. Lord, I just bless you. I just I don't have any words. I can't give you nothing else. I just sit here and God's like, no, we've been to talk. <laughs> You got to love it, man. But this is what my pastor told me. Jesus does not reveal something he does not want to heal. So I promise you, if you're only aware of, like, negative things about somebody without a solution, you break out of, like, discernment, and you can get very easily into, like, a critical spirit or suspicion because Jesus doesn't reveal stuff without solutions. Like, he's not empty-handed. He has keys. <clears throat> and I remember... I asked, I was like, Jesus, where were you the night I was touched? And I was like weeping. And I saw Jesus walk in the room. So picture an all, all dark room. And then literally his face lit up the room. Like he walked in and all I could see was his face and his beard and his eyes. And I was like this close to him. And he looked at me like I was the only human that ever existed. Like I can tell I had his full focus and that he wasn't thinking. Like 
think about this, okay? Y'all have had intimacy with people. You know when you have somebody's full attention, and you're like, man, this is like eternity, like puppy dog eyes. Imagine Jesus looking at you and knowing that he's not at the same time thinking. Like you can feel that he's not thinking about other stuff. He just sees you. He's like that with everybody all at the same time. It is mind-blowing. And so he's looking at me, and I know he's not worried about trying to fix something on the other side of the world. Like, you know, and I, I know sometimes people are like, God, there's such a broken world. Why do you think about me? I'm like, I was never there because I was, like, very selfish. But <clears throat> I could feel God so jealous for me that, like, it was like everything was just, like, me and him. Like, everything else was shut out, and he had me in this place that he wanted. And... I remember I was like, where were you? And I heard him say, I'm sorry. And he hugged me. And as soon as he hugged me, it was like, when you touch him, you get revelation, almost like osmosis. Like I touched him and I knew that the person who touched me was molested and was immediately able to like forgive. I was like, oh, it was like, I literally was like, woo, that happened. Like, it was like connected, dude. It was so crazy. And I remember just sitting there, I was like, and my friend was like, this is where everything changed for me. I was like, holy, she's like, I want you to just ask the Holy Spirit what lies you learned here. And so I just said, Holy Spirit, what lie did I learn here? And clear as day, the Lord said, you believe that you're gay because you didn't stop it and because you liked it. Because if somebody touches you in a sexual way, say you had your eyes closed, and I'm not trying to be weird, your body's just going to respond to touch. And the shame that came afterward is the thing that tried to define me yeah. and the guilt. But my body was normal and responding the way it did. It didn't mean I liked it. It was just its response. And the enemy had me believe so long that because I didn't put up a fight against the molestation that I enjoyed it and that that meant that that's what I liked this whole time. And the, the lie that was in me for like 20 years, Jesus broke off. And it literally felt like I took off football gear on my inner man. And I remember I was forgiven and breaking these things and I said the Holy Spirit was the truth and you just said you're not gay you're my son and I was just like whoa like <laughs> I sound like a surfer whoa but in the mind I was just like whoa like I, I do that all the time I'm like whoa I was doing it in the car when I got off the airport just she said something and she was like how you doing prophet you know <laughs> Apostle Jeanette fitting to be praying in some tongues y'all she's like good night get some rest she can she be in the spirit. Hey, was your food good? Robobo Shanda, I'm like, yes, it was. You know what I mean? Y'all better start praying to each other in tongues. Be like, good morning. <laughs> so literally, I'm sitting here and I was just blown. <laughs> <laughs> took me out. <laughs> Jesus, be my strength. So <clears throat> I, I literally remember feeling so free. Whoa! Yeah, hold your hands out. We just say more joy. Hey, kid, and I saw you. Come on. Woo! Whoa! Shadi ada ba kiri ada da 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 seke ada da da ba ba ba. Bye bye depression. Yeke ada da ba seri ada da ba 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 ba. Joy. Woo! You better get it while it's good. Whoa! Whoa! Come on, more, Lord. Yeah, I just feel like the Lord's breaking like a morning off of you. More joy. Tickle her, Jesus. <laughs> so I'm sitting here, and in this encounter, I said, Y'all ever had those moments when you're a little kid and you spin like this nonstop like you're crazy and then when you stop your body it's like woo like that like that little Kim dance where she's like 
you trying to keep it together? That's where I was internally after I was forgiving. And I got to this place where I felt like I was going to pass out. Like I reached this threshold where I could not handle the love of God and deliverance at the same time. It literally felt like I was going to pass out. And it was all this trauma, all this sexual dysfunction, things that I did throughout the years just coming off just by him standing near me. Like it wasn't like he was just touching and doing something. He literally like was there and I was just being healed. Like every time I reflect back on it, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's actually, it. it's, it's never the same. Like there's so much in your encounters. Woo. Yeah, baby, put your hand on the shoulder. Yeah, the Lord's coming out, like pulling out deep shame. Lord, I thank you that you don't embarrass her. So, Lord, I thank you for the joy and I thank you for the healing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lord, I break off every idle word spoken over her right now that she's too much or too emotional or all over the place. Lord, I break off every word curse. And I say, Lord, that the truth be planted and that wherever your hand is touching right now, Father, you're filling it with joy. Beauty for ashes, beauty for ashes. Hey, so in this encounter, I remember telling the Lord, this is so funny that I thought this way. I just remember telling the Lord, God, I will never sleep with another man if I have your presence like this. And it's been, honey, 10 years. I ain't going back. Like I'm here for Jesus, man. He loves me. And I said, if I have your presence like this, I, will, I, I just want to reemphasize that. If I have your presence like this, I did not ask God to take away my attractions or make me not gay. His presence was what I was looking for the whole time. And so we've got to stop coming in like, man, I hope their attractions change. Did your anger change? Did your bitterness change? There's stuff that we feel that is not a definer of who we are. Jesus was tempted in every way, right? So was he tempted with homosexuality? Be real. What's a temptation mean? It has to be a pull there. So just because you're tempted, does that mean that's who you are? Okay. Because you got mad at somebody, does that mean you're a killer? Everywhere you go, like, I guess I'm just a killer. It's just my lifestyle. I'm just a murderer now. <laughs> You'll catch me on Netflix. Like, I mean, we don't, if we can just be real, we can have way more compassion on people in the LGBTQ community. There's stuff in us where we're perfectionist and we don't believe in grace and we want to be works-based. That's just as grieving as just not trusting God that your attractions can change or you can do this or that. Like, it's the same across the board. Now, obviously, there's different messes from acting on sin. Like, lying isn't going to hurt you as bad in a circumstance as much as, like, fighting someone where, like, there's way more damage involved, like, and it spills out. But the reality is it still hurts us. It still is a snare to kill us and take us out, right? <clears throat> so diving into here, this is where I want to go. Um, I really felt the Lord give me my, um, the heart for my ministry that he gave me. It's called He Still Cares. And God of the Rainbow is a facet of that focused on LGBTQ things. But... <clears throat> When I first got saved and I had these encounters, a month or two later, I went to Haiti, right? And when I came back from Haiti, when I went to Haiti, it was like I saw the Bible came alive. Like, I mean, people getting demons cast out of them. This girl fell out and she manifested and only one eye was moving and she was speaking in demonic tongues. I mean, stuff that she would see in like a crazy movie. And then it wasn't like the exorcist where she was like, never, I'm not leaving. It was like Jesus. And she was like, boom, dealt with like. I saw the authority of Jesus, and I was like, you can't run up on God, baby. Like, he going to get it. Like, I mean, literally just seeing how real the Bible was and how much, like, we have in him and our hope. And I was like, I got to be wherever the presence is. Like, where's worship? We going to worship today? I mean, I, was, I sounded like I was addicted. I was like, we going to worship at your house? We going to worship at your house? We can worship at your house and then go to worship over there. And then they got to be worshiping up over here. Like, I was so addicted to the presence of God because anywhere that he was, I wanted to be because I had saw just how real and close he comes to us. 
And in the same season, my pastor was like, you're going to play in a church with me. And anybody in here who's playing a church knows the spiritual warfare when you play in a church is like just somebody punching you in the head and you just don't believe nothing else. You're like, this church will be planted and I ain't giving up. And you might come out swollen and bruised and busted, but you shall have a seed. <clears throat> and in this season, shortly after the planning, I found out that I had OCD. And does anybody ever know, does anybody know what OCD is? Okay, so a common thing about OCD is people think it's just about germs and cleaning, but OCD can also be like, are you mad at me? I feel like you're mad at me, and you're not telling me, but you're mad at me, but I feel like you're not saying your truth, but you are mad. I mean, like, intrusive thoughts, fear, anxiety, I mean, like, it was eating me up. And not only that, but the intrusive thoughts weren't always demonic. Sometimes they were my flesh, and... I had no way to deal with them, and it always carried emotion with it. So, like, I'd have thoughts like, what if I didn't believe in God? And it was a fear of not having control, which control was the root. But in my mind, I'm like, I can't have, like, this unbelief. Like, oh, God. what? And then, like, another thought would be like, what if you sold your soul to the devil? Like, you're going to go to hell. And I was like, dude, I'm screwed. What if I did that and I didn't know? Like, just intrusive thoughts are completely irrational. And so I was like, dude, what if I committed the unpardonable sin? I'm screwed. Like, how do I get out? Like, what is this? And the Lord really had broke me in this area where um, I want to give you this nugget. Sometimes it's not a demon. It's actually you and your refusal to deal with what's in you. And so it's like, oh, it's spiritual warfare. And really it's your, your refusal to strengthen what's weak and make like, you know, so that whatever's lame and out of joint can be healed. And when everything is spiritual warfare and everything's the devil, you never take accountability for you. Right. Oh, man, this thought is just the spirit of lust keeps getting me and I'm, I'm struggling. It's like, no, you want to lust because you don't believe Jesus will touch you fast enough when you're alone. And we get close to this place where everything gets spiritualized and it's a way to get out of blame for our immaturity relationally. Now, if somebody, if you went somewhere... And um, your wife's like, my car broke down. And then she didn't answer the phone. Are you just going to text her and be like, hey, are you okay? One time? Probably not, right? That might sound like a dramatic expression, but hear me out. So many times when we're in a place where we have to fight, we're like, God, if you don't come in, I'm going to give in. If you don't do this, I'm going to relapse. If you don't come. And when we don't get immediate answers, we shut off and we go into sensuality. It's this thing, I call it the Ephesians 4 mindset. <clears throat> and this is for people who have been in the Lord. Um, and I want to encourage you with this because sometimes the Bible just slaps you and it's all good. So Ephesians 4, 17, we can get some scripture in. So this I say and solemnly affirm together with the Lord, that you must no longer live as the unbelieving Gentiles live. So do you know that the Gentiles live by the, 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 the reasoning of their mind, right? And as Christians, you can live as a reasoning of your mind by having revelation and watching 400 YouTube sermons about how to deal with something instead of in the moment having a relationship with God being like, what do you want me to deal with this? So when mechanics don't work, we can build a case against God and justify our acting out of sin versus in the moment being like, God, I need you. Like today I need you. Like right now in this moment, like relating, we allow ourselves to go by the reasoning of our mind, even if it's revelation. And it says what happens. Our understanding is darkened. Well, God, you know, especially when people are believing for healing, it's like, you know, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. And their reasoning is clouded. They're alienated and self-banished from the life of God. You can self-banish yourself out of God's mercy. God actually wants to forgive you and already forgave you, but you believe you have to be so many days free from porn or so many days free from this, and God kept a record. Here's how you know you self-banish yourself from the life of God. You believe God has a record of something that he already forgot, and you still, even if you confess it, he still has a record. It's still there, self-banished. The devil didn't even do that. We're in agreement with it. And we're shadow boxing when we say, oh, it's a demon. We're shadow boxing. You have to believe what God says when he says, I love you. I forgive you. When you confess, it's done. Okay? <clears throat> Here, check this out. Because of the willful ignorance and spiritual blindness that is within them, and because of the hardness and insensitivity of their heart, 
They, having become callous and unfeeling, so say this with me, hardness of heart and unfeeling. Okay. These people, you don't have to repeat after me anymore, have given themselves over to unbridled sensuality, eagerly craving the practice of every kind of impurity. It's so crazy that when you have a place where God actually wants you to walk out of obedience, you can find your, like, I just couldn't not give in to this. Like, to, for me, it was always porn. I could not give in. Like, I just, I'm stuck. You know, you say you promise a way out, but there's no way I could. There's the real issue. Porn is the fruit. Hardness of heart is the root. And something pricked you that you never dealt with with God where you feel like he let you down and you stopped praying and it stopped being, he stopped being your comfort. Are you following me? Hardness of heart causes you to re rely on what you've learned before instead of in the moment asking God, Lord, I need you. And I, I have this thing inside me saying, I feel like you're not going to help me and you're keeping this. Like that's intimacy. That's a sacrifice that fire will fall on. I'm bringing my concerns and everything to you. I'm casting them onto you because if I don't, I'm going to act like, you know, well, I watch this YouTube sermon. I bind this, and 10 minutes later, you're acting out porn or you're acting out doing something or you're doing what you didn't want to do or you're feeding this thing and you're like, I just, I'm defeated. I'll never get out. Bro, you are your issue, not a demon. Jesus is expecting you to grow in love through pressure, not despising weak love in you, because he knows you love him, but showing you how to overcome in the moment. Because when you're like, God, I just don't believe that you're here, he'll take that as an offering. He actually wants you to confess the truth so that he can raise you up. So if you say, I don't believe you'll help me, and you let him in, that then becomes an altar and not a problem. It's no longer a deficit. Are you following me? God, I feel like you're not going to help me. This is, that's where he wants to meet you. That's the real you. Are you following me? Not this, I will never confess death. Life and death are in the power of time. And you're like literally like just yelling and talking to yourself. And Jesus is like, whenever you're ready to be weak so I can be strong, like you can stop with these like charismatic gymnastics. Like I promise you, my mercy can handle what's broken in you. My grace can empower anything. But we have to be real and stop wanting to fall in love with the seduction of appearing strong so that we don't feel the pain of rejection. We don't feel looked down on by people around the church. Well, they just believe stronger than me. And if I just say where I'm at, they're going to be like, well, why haven't you done this? And why haven't And I Y'all, that's a child needing comfort. And Jesus does not turn away people who come to him. You following me? So the fear of your pastor or somebody scolding you is keeping you even from the secret place alone, letting your father restore you so that you trust that when you come to him alone, he'll love you. He's not expecting you to jump through flaming hoops while you're being shot. And it's like, man, you're immature. Come on. I'm over here. And you're like, but I don't even believe that you want to forgive me. Like, he's not in that. You remember Elijah? He was in the cave. He wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the storm. He wasn't in the wind. He was actually in the whisper. The whisper is always there when you actually give space for it. People are like, well, God's just silent in this season. No, he's not. Your expectation is louder than what he's trying to tell you. You're expecting something from God that he's not even saying. Like, God, you said this, and it was going to look this way. Bro, if it's different, different's always better. <clears throat> Here's the truth. Regarding your previous way of life, you put off your old self, which is being corrupted through deceitful desires, and be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind. It's getting a little bit hot. Is it okay? I'm wearing a tank top. Is it okay if I just take my shawl off? Is that weird? Okay. Thank you, God. I didn't want to be flexing these guns, <laughs> cause anybody to stumble. <laughs> In reality, I'm like obese and like sweating, and so nobody's going to trip, I promise. <clears throat> so, in this, you got to have humor to break off the, what are you doing? Like, who is this guy with like a chandelier in his nose? Okay. <clears throat> Truth, I'm going to say something that sounds scientific and makes me sound like I'm deep, but it ain't really that deep. Truth has inertia. How do I, how do I back this up, okay? Um, if you are in the Spirit, therefore also keep in step with the Spirit. 
So if I live in and camp out in what I know, and I don't process with truth on the way, regardless of whether or not I'm sinning in the moment, I'm being conformed to the pattern of my emotions, my feelings, my thoughts, my unbelief, or a truth is trying to lead me in that day. And I could blame God for how hard things are. In reality, it's me not wanting to feel disciplined. And my, the flesh wants comfort. The flesh wants you to, you know, like you just got to rule today. Dying is the only way to live. You actually have to go through that painful, God, I don't even want to read my Bible. Bro, I'm telling you, if you say that, that's more real to God than being like, this is the truth. This is my sword. Sometimes. People are like, yeah, I just trust everything. And in reality, if we trust everything in here, then why aren't we being intimate with him? We have all the good language, everything right to say, but no power or intimacy. And power is actually different in a believer's life because you can be completely broken and have power. In the world, you've got to be fully healed to be strong, fully this, to have power. Jesus gave power to broken people. He gave keys to people before they were uneducated men. Are you following me? So it isn't really how much you know. It isn't about having the key or the principle. It's about being real with God and stop trying to be stronger than you really are and allowing him to love you so that you can actually be a witness. Because whatever he does in you, you become a gate so that someone around you can get that too. But if all you're giving somebody is YouTube sermons that you learned and rehearsed things in your head and you're, well, this is what you got to do. And you wonder why you're not seeing a yoke break. It's because we're rejecting our own process. That's where the fire is, is in you dying alone when it feels like no one else around you wants to mature. No one else around you wants to pray. They want to watch TV and it's just you. Well, I don't want to do it if it's just me. We got to be willing to say it. I don't want to pray if we're not going to get together. Oh, apostles not preaching. I might not come to church today. I'll just watch online. Well, count that as you getting whipped one day when you're like, man, I just feel so stressed out. You can never blame someone else for why you didn't grow. How did David grow in a, oh my God, how did David grow in authority and rank under abusive leadership? You could be under the worst leader, weak, immature, and has nothing to do with your ability to die to yourself learning how to take your thoughts captive, learning how to honor authority, learning how to grow, learning how to handle love. It's not about anybody else, but how you respond to Jesus in the moment. And believing, if, believing that he'll have communion with you when it feels like you're dying. That's where it's at. The battle is over agreement. You know, my wife um, presently has breast cancer. I've seen one of my friends as a worship leader get healed of cancer. We prayed, and this thing did not dissolve. Does that mean God's a liar? What if that thing not dissolving was the, wasn't the issue? What if the whole battle was Jesus just trusting me, or me trusting Jesus, and literally, I'm not trying to like pull straws here, but what if this whole thing was just like, you know, and what's so wild about this is prior to me finding out this diagnosis, <clears throat> the Lord's like, I want you to study Job. And a lot of pro-healing people are like, I don't want to read that book because... It's not interpreted right. Really, you know, it was the devil who took everything away. In reality, Job lost his family, man. No matter how we want to do this stuff, he was righteous and he struggled. Well, Job was a fearful man because he prayed for it. It doesn't matter. God said, have you considered Job? God thought fondly of Job. And here's the reality. You can have all the prosperity and goodness, but if you don't trust God when there comes adversity, you're not carrying something real. So if you're just blessed into believing good things about God, but you can't carry that when it hurts. What are you bringing to the table? Because the revelation about who he is doesn't change. So if he's healer and you're going through a diagnosis, don't, the, the way that you win is that you just don't change your mind about him. Very simple. Just that's the plumb line. I'm not changing my mind about you, God, no matter how I feel. Satan hates that. The whole thing about that fight was he literally just wanted to change Job's mind. Today in this room, are you letting the enemy change your mind? But we're like, God, I trust you. This season is so hard. This season, bro, let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews. <laughs> 
Focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, disregarding the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Just consider him and meditate on him who endured from sinners such bitter hostility against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The problem with in these struggles is we're completely self-focused. 100%. The way to not lose heart is meditating on Jesus. But if you meditate on your problem, you'll build accusation against him. Adversity came in so that Job would step out of the place of revelation and build a case against God versus standing on what he knew against, with God and letting intimacy be the thing that weathered adversity. Your intimacy can weather and wear out adversity. But what are you doing with your mind? Are you coming into agreement with the adversity? Or are you trusting what Jesus has shown you to be true and saying, what are you wanting to teach me in this season? This diagnosis, the enemy wants to be something that's going to like build a case against God. It's an altar. It's going to be something that fire falls on and people who need hope, they're going to draw to this thing as a testimony because God's dealing with it. And when they're confused, they can say, oh, I can actually trust God and not give up. Is that possible? 100%, man. You can go through something and not quit. That's what people are looking for. This endurance turns into, that's why you can count all trials for joy. And the testing and all this stuff, because you realize this whole thing is just reduced to agreement. He just wants me to change what I believe. And if I just stay still and trust God, he deals with my stuff. Very rarely has I heard God say, pick up the sword and fight war like people are like man I, just, I gotta bind this thing it's like bro very rarely have i felt god say do that it's all about relationship my my heart is very much on just being real with god because that's what matters like not being fake, not being stronger, not trying to, you know, there's so much pressure to post a good word nowadays or, you know, you believe you got to share something just because you had a quiet time. Like, oh, I was just in the word today and the Lord was speaking to me about Rehoboam. And I'm like, bro, chill out. Jesus loves you. Amen. Like we got to stop believing that what we come up with is what makes us have a seat at the table. If you came in here complaining, you have a seat at the table. If you came in here unbelieving, you have a seat at the table. If you came in here lusting, you have a seat at the table. Because when you see the food that is given freely, you don't have to strive for things that don't satisfy. So it's not about us being, we have to, like, we, the tendency is we get saved and immediately get churchy. And then we're like, oh, I won't do that again. God, I just, it's just trusting you. And the next adversity comes, churchy. This religious spirit, dude, like we talk about. Bro, just stay broken. Beat the enemy. I'm broken before you try to break me. What are you trying to take to me that I don't even have? He is what, he gives me what I need. And so if you can't contaminate the source, there's nothing for me to fret about. He can't put a shadow of changing on God. He can just try to make you change what you believe about him. One of the things that go with what I opened up today with about was, you know, stop fighting to believe that God loves you is sometimes, and I found myself even doing it today, but I was like, no, I'm about to just worship right before we ended to build my life. And this joy hit me was we've got to stop going to this place where like we worship and we worship and then we feel the presence of God. And we're like, Lord, I'm just sorry for not trusting. It's like, bro, Jesus didn't ask you to go into worship so that then once you feel the presence, you can start communing and repenting like and take the focus off of him and then back onto you and like what's going on. Bro, just enjoy him because his kindness in that moment is leading you to repentance. So you don't believe the same thing. But it's so easy to just do enough to feel the presence of God and then stay out of intimacy and then do the mechanics of stuff. And that's not being relational. Is that following me? Is that thought connecting? So stop it. I'm just playing. We have, that's where the issue is. There, we get to a certain point with him and they're like, okay, now it's on me. And we have to stop saying now me and just start leaving our arms open to relationship. 
This is what tries to sift us as leaders. We go from grace to works very subtly. Well, I learned this and I got to do it. Jesus, did the Holy Spirit tell you to do that right now? If he didn't, then don't do it. We got to stop doing these like routines and formulas and methods and the 10 best decrees. And then, ne- bro, sometimes you just don't tell me to decree nothing. And that's okay. Are you following me? Is this helping you guys some? We're looking for these keys. Well, what do I got to do? Just be with them. There's your solution. You, you are so loved. Bro, if you were to watch porn, and I'm not saying this so that you have a license to sin because you're held accountable, praise God. And if you didn't, both times you're loved the exact same, but you believe you're more valuable if you're good. One is struggling to believe you're loved, and one is just a response out of loved. Don't, don't get the two confused. Nothing you do will make you more lovable, and anything you do outside of that is just a response to love, not a, a way to earn and keep this kind of love. That's the lie that creeps in every time. Once you receive this breakthrough, it's up to you to keep the good thing going. It's up to you to be strong. It's up to you to be this. It's up to you to never be broken again. It's up to you to, we've got to stop that, dude. That's the little fox that comes. It's all in how much you've had quiet time this week. Oh, you missed a day? Loser, you're going to hell. Shadow ban. Like, does that make sense? 